boys and girls. Today is Tuesday, and today we are going to finish chapter 10 in Little House in the Big Woods, and we are talking about cheese making, okay? Ma is about to begin making cheese, and um, we are going to read all about it in chapter 10. Also, I'm going to share with you a picture of what cheese looked like um, back then in a basket. So I'll show you, I'll share that with you in a little bit. Um, today you will have to uh, do language IXL for homework today. After we get off here, um, I would encourage you to go and get your IXL finished. You're going to um, look for actions and dialogue um, in IXL. So you're going to read a little bit of a passage and you're going to look for actions and dialogue to understand characters. Now what that means is you're going to read about a character and you're going to see how they act based on what you read about them. And then you're going to also listen or you're going to read about what they might say in the passage, which is the dialogue when two people are talking or there a lot of people are talking. And so you're going to take the dialogue and the actions and you're going to try to figure out what the characters are trying to do in the story or what they're trying, what they're acting like. So it's kind of inferring. You're like inferring about what, and you're also predicting based on the dialogue, the speaking and the actions of the characters, what is going on in the story, what might happen in the story. And also, what can you figure out about these characters by their actions and what they're saying? So that's going to be your IXL skill today. Okay, it's going to have to do with inferring. But for now, I am going to begin reading again in Little House in the Big Woods. We are on page 186. So if you don't have your book, please go get that right now. You can pause the video and come back, and then we're going to begin reading. All right. Um, another, oh, one more thing, boys and girls. I really, really need you to read for at least 20 minutes today. Silent reading, 20 minutes. Um, so read to self. Have some quiet time for yourself to just go and read. Okay, 20 minutes, please. All right. Um, I am reading with permission from Harper Collins Publishing. All right. Now, um, before in chapter 10, we read about Laura, and she had just finished getting a, head, a kettle and a head from her dad because she was very sad that her hair was brown and her sister Mary's hair was golden. And she was comparing herself with her sister and how she thought her sister's hair was so much more prettier than her own hair. And then she asked Paul, well, do you like brown or do you like golden hair? And Paul said, well, I've got brown hair. And Laura was like, well, I never thought about that. You know, Laura's special with who she is, you know, and God made everybody different. God made us the way he wants us to be. And he made us for a reason. We look like how we look for a reason. We have the hair color we have for a reason. And so we need to be proud of who we are. And Laura figures that out. And so um, she and Mary kind of were competing against each other. And that's, that's kind of silly. She didn't need to do that. All right, so we're at the top of page 186. And now we're going to start talking about cheese in just a minute. All right, mom is busy too. Laura and Mary helped her weed the garden and they helped her feed the calves and the hens. They gathered the eggs and they helped make cheese. When the grass was tall and thick in the woods and the cows were giving plenty of milk, that was the time to make cheese. Somebody must kill a calf for cheese could not be made without rennet and rennet is the lining of a young calf's stomach. The calf must be very young so that it had never eaten anything but milk. All right, let's stop right there. Rennet is the, it's, it's called an enzyme, which is a part of the stomach that causes milk to curdle. 
or to stick together, which is called coagulation. And that means to stick together, combine, and to kind of, it's like a clump together, okay? And those were the, were the curdled, that was the curdled milk. Um, and you had to have that in order to make cheese. So they had to have that rennet from the calf's stomach. Okay, I know it's kind of kind of gross to me, but I don't know. All right, next paragraph. Laura was afraid that Paul must kill one of the little calves in the barn. They were so sweet. One fawn colored, one was fawn colored, and one was red. And their hair was so soft, and their large eyes so wondering. Laura's heart beat fast when Ma talked to Paul about making cheese. Paul would not kill either of his calves because they were heifers and would grow into cows. He went to Grandpa's and to Uncle Henry's to talk about the cheese making. And Uncle Henry said he would kill one of his calves. There would be enough rennet for Aunt Polly and Grandma and Ma so they could all make cheese. So Paul went again to Uncle Henry's and came back with a piece of the little calf's stomach. It was like a piece of soft grayish white leather, all rigid and rough on one side. When the cows were milked at night, Ma set the milk away in pans. In the morning, she skimmed off the cream to make into butter later. Then when the morning's milk had cooled, she mixed it with the skimmed milk and set it all on the stove to heat. A bit of the rennet tied in a cloth was soaking in warm water. When the milk was heated enough, Ma squeezed every drop of water from the rennet in the cloth, and then she poured the water into the milk. She stirred it well and left it in a warm place by the stove. In a little while, it thickened into a smooth, quivery mass. With a long knife, Ma cut this mass into little squares, turn the page, and let it stand while the curd separated from the whey. Then she poured it all into a cloth and let the thin yellowish whey drain out. When no more whey dripped from the cloth, Ma emptied the curd into a big pan and salted it, turning and mixing it well. Laura and Mary were always there, helping all they could. They loved to eat bits of the curd when Ma was salting it. It squeaked in their teeth. So they liked the curd part. They liked, liked it as a snack. And there you see Ma and Laura with the water and the whey and the curds. And she's soaking that rennet in that tub of water. All right, we are up here on the other side of the page at the top of page 189. They love to eat bits of the curd when Ma was salting it. It squeaked in their teeth. Under the cherry tree outside the back door, Paul had put up the board to press the cheese on. He had cut two grooves the length of the board and laid the board on blocks, one end a little higher than the other. Under the lower end stood an empty pail. Ma put her wooden cheese hoop on the board, spread a clean wet cloth all over the inside of it, and filled it heaping full of the chunks of salted curd. She covered this with another clean wet cloth and laid on top of it a round board cut small enough to go inside the cheese hoop. Then she lifted a heavy rock on top of the board. All day long, the round board settled slowly under the weight of the rock and whey pressed out and ran down the grooves of the board into the pail. Next morning, Ma would take out the round pale yellow cheese as large as a milk pan, turn the page. Then she made more curd and filled the cheese hoop again. Every morning, she took the new cheese, new cheese out of the press and trimmed it smooth. She sewed a cloth tightly around it and rubbed the cloth all over with fresh butter. Then she put the cheese on a shelf in the pantry. Every day, she wiped every cheese carefully with a wet cloth, then rubbed it all over with fresh butter once more and laid it down on its other side. After a great many days, the cheese was ripe and there was a hard rind all over it. So it started out really mushy and soft, almost like brie, if you've ever had brie before, a cheese called brie, which is a very soft cheese. 
almost it, you can spread it on crackers. Um, it was it was like that type of consistency. And after many many days of her putting that butter over it and leaving it out, it would harden, and then she got hard cheese. Okay, so that's what they had to do. All right, we are on the third paragraph down where it says then Ma. Then Ma wrapped each cheese in paper and laid it away on the high shelf. There was nothing more to do with it, but eat it. Laura and Mary liked cheese making. They liked to eat the curd that squeaked in their teeth and they liked to eat the edges Ma paired off the big round yellow cheeses to make them smooth before she sewed them up in cloth. Ma laughed at them for eating green cheese. The moon, is, the moon is made of green cheese, some people say, she told them. The new cheese did look like, round, like the round moon when it came up behind the trees, but it was not green. It was yellow, like the moon. It's green, Ma said, because it isn't ripened yet. When it's curd and ripened, it won't be a green cheese. Is the moon really made of green cheese? Laura asked. Ma laughed. I think people say that because it looks like a green cheese, she said, but appearances are deceiving. That means things are not always the way they look. Then while she wiped all the green cheeses and rubbed them with butter, she told them about the dead cold moon that is like a little world on which nothing grows. The first day Ma made cheese, Laura tasted the way. She tasted without saying anything to Ma. And when Ma turned around and saw, turn the page, her face, Ma laughed. That night, while she was washing the supper dishes and Mary and Laura were wiping them, Ma told Paul that Laura had tasted the whey and didn't like it. You wouldn't start to death on Ma's whey like old Grimes did on his wife's, Paul said. Laura begged him to tell her about old Grimes. So, though Paul was tired, he took his fiddle out of his box and played and sang for Laura. Old Grimes is dead, that good old man. We ne'er shall see him more. He used to eat an old gray coat all buttoned down before. Old Grimes' wife made skim milk cheese Old Grimes, he drank the way. There come, came an east wind from the west and blew old Grimes away. There you have it, said Paul. She was a mean, tight-fisted woman. If she hadn't skimmed all the milk, a little cream would have run off in the way, and old Grimes might have staggered along. But she skimmed off every bit of cream, and poor old Grimes got so thin the wind blew him away, plumb starved to death. Then Paul looked at Ma and said, nobody starved to death when you were around, Caroline. Uh, well, no, Ma said, no, Charles, not if you were there to provide for us. Paul was pleased. It was also pleasant, the doors and windows wide open to the summer evening, the dishes making little cheerful sounds together as Ma washed them and Mary and Laura wiped, and Paul putting away the fiddle and smiling and whistling, whistling softly to himself. After a while, he said, I'm going over to Henry's tomorrow morning, Caroline, to borrow his grubbing hoe. Those sprouts are getting waist high around the stumps in the wheat field. A man just has to keep everlasting at it, or the woods will take back the place meaning he had to clear out the land. He had to clear out the trees or trees and plants would take over everything. Second paragraph, page 194. Early next morning, he started to walk to Uncle Henry's, but before long, he came hurrying back, hitched the horses to the wagon, threw in his ax, the two wash tubs, the wash boiler, and all the pills and wooden buckets there were. I know if I'll need them all, Caroline, he said, but I'd hate to want them and not have them. Oh, what is it? What is it? Laura asked, jumping up and down with excitement. 
Paul's found a bee tree, Ma said. Maybe he'll bring us some honey. It was noon before Paul came driving home. Laura had been watching for him and she ran out to the wagon as soon as it stopped by the barnyard, but she could not see into it. Paul called, Caroline, if you'll come take this pill of honey, I'll go unhitch. Ma came out to the wagon disappointed. She said, well, Charles, even a pill of honey is something. Then she looked into the wagon and threw up her hands. Paul laughed. All the pills and buckets were heaping full of dripping golden honeycomb. Both tubs were piled full, and so was the wash boiler. So he tricked her. He was being funny, joking with her. Paul and Ma went back and forth carrying the two loaded tubs and the wash boiler and all the buckets and pails into the house. Ma heaped a plate high with the golden pieces and covered all the rest neatly with cloths. For dinner, they all had as much of the delicious honey as they could eat, and Paul told them how he found the bee tree. I didn't take my gun, he said, because I wasn't hunting, and now it's summer there wasn't much danger of meeting trouble. Panthers and bears are so fat this time of year that they're lazy and good-natured. Well, I took a shortcut through the woods and I nearly ran into a big bear. I came around a clump of underbrush and there he was, not as far from me as across this room. He looked it round at me and I guess he, did, he saw I didn't have a gun. Anyway, he didn't pay any more attention to me. He was standing at the foot of a big tree and bees were buzzing all around him. They couldn't sting through his thick fur, and he kept brushing them away from his head with one paw. I stood there watching him, and he put the other paw into a hole in the tree and drew it all out dripping with honey. He licked the honey off his paw and reached in for more, but by that time, I had found me a club. I wanted that honey for myself. So I made a great racket, banging the club against a tree and yelling. The bear was so fat and so full of honey that he just dropped on all fours and waddled off among the trees. I chased him some distance and got him going fast, away from the bee tree, and then I came back for the wagon. Laura asked him how he got the honey away from the trees. Ah, that was easy, Paul said. I left the horses back in the woods where they wouldn't get stung, and then I chopped the tree down and split it open. Didn't the bees sting you? No, said Paul. Bees never sting me. Look in that picture. Look at that bear just sticking his whole hand in there. And that's what bears do, especially little black bears that like to eat honey in there. <clears throat> They'll stick their hand in the tree and grab all that honey out. <clears throat> Turn the page. The whole tree was hollow and filled from top to bottom with honey. The bees must have been storing honey there for years. Some of it was old and dark, but I guess I got enough good clean honey to last us a long time. Laura was sorry for the poor bees. She said, they worked so hard and now they won't have any honey. But Paul said there was lots of honey left for the bees and there was another large hollow tree nearby into which they could move. He said it was time they had a clean new home. They would take the old honey he had left in the old tree, make it into fresh new honey and store it into their home. They would save every drop of the spilled honey and put it away and they would have plenty of honey again long before winter came. All right, boys and girls, that wraps up chapter 10 of cheese making and how Paul and the pioneers back then would go and get honey. They would actually have to go to a tree, scare bears away, and get that honey out. But they would do it in the summertime when the bears were not real hungry and looking for food. That was a safer time to do that. All right, I am going to share with you really quick a picture <clears throat> of what cheese looked like after it was made back in the pioneer days. See the crust that formed across the hard part 
I call it crust. It was kind of a crusty. It's hard. And because after, after Ma had let it sit out for several days, this is kind of what would form around the cheese. And inside it was softer. But by now it was a harder cheese than what it started out being really soft and mushy. This is kind of what it would look like. And they would put it in a basket. Okay, so that's what Pioneer cheese looks like. All right, boys and girls. Well, that wraps up what we were doing today. Um, please make sure you do your IXL. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.